Welcome into this episode of Hand Raised Guys. I'm Chase Parm, and on today's episode, presented by Comer Heating and Air, Southern Air Conditioning and Heating. More on those guys in a second. We're going to talk to Mark Etheridge. He works for D1Baseball.com. He's covered college baseball for 25 years or so. Mark, one of the uh, the great people in the uh, kind of the national game of college baseball, with the season starting just a few weeks. We're gonna we're gonna take a big picture look. Why was last year different? What's up with this year in the SEC? Mark really specializes in the SEC and has for the majority of his career. So we're going to get you ready. We'll obviously hit a lot of more Ole Miss-specific content leading up to that season opening series at Hawaii. But today, kind of a big primer, kind of looking at the overall scope of the game, where it's at, and moving forward here for uh, college baseball in 2024. Mike Bianco going into his 24th season as head coach. Ole Miss trying to bounce back from uh, by far their worst season since the 90s, 6-24 and 24 in the SEC. You know the score by now. So uh, how'd they do in the portal? They do enough. What's the proof of concept for this new era for Ole Miss? A lot of SEC stuff. That's all the things we hit on on today's show. And this is a show, again, brought to you by Comer Heating and Air, Southern Air Conditioning and Heating. Hopefully you guys had used them to uh, get prepped for the cold weather, had all the ice going on. I know that they did a ton of service calls for pipes and air conditioning and things. You can really count on them. They're great people. If you're in the Oxford area, that's Comer. It is 662-234-5303. If you're in DeSoto County, Hernando area, call Southern 662-429-429. Sorry, 429-4429 for Southern. Just, uh, again, great company, great partners of ours. And this hand raised guys every single week brought to you by Comer Heating and Air and Southern Air Conditioning and Heating. This will also be an Oxford Exxon podcast, the Oxford Exxon Highway 6 West in Oxford. You know all about the beer cave, the lunch specials, 569, couple sides bread, any size fountain drink. They're up and down I-55 though, not just Oxford. It's all blue sky locations, North Mississippi as well. They have their big superstore going on, getting built there in Macomb. So uh, blue sky taking care of you wherever you are in the state of Mississippi. And of course, we do most of our shows from the Clark Ford Studio, 662-257-1900 in Amory, Mississippi is Clark Ford, Highway 25. Corey wants to be your car guy, wants to be your truck guy. He'll help you out no matter where you are in the car buying process. Give Corey a chance. He'll move you along. He'll get you going there and get you a great deal from Clark Ford. And then all of our guests join you from the Campbell Clinic hotline. Campbell Clinic now in Oxford with your orthopedic needs. Give him a call. I know a lot of people were uh, getting banged up and the sledding and the ice, and hopefully you didn't need an orthopedic company, but if you did, Campbell here, ready to take care of you with Campbell Heating and Air. So let's jump on into it now. Again, this is uh, Mark Etheridge from D1Baseball.com, SEC Extra, a part of D1Baseball.com, and we're going to give you a uh, kind of a national or conference-wide preview to the college baseball season. Mark Etheridge, here with us on the Campbell Clinic Hotline as a baseball just a few weeks away. Mark, I was I was kind of thinking about it. You and I first connected. You were doing SC baseball for Rivals back in the day at that point, or at least on the Rivals uh, platform. How many years is this? How did you kind of get your start in, in college baseball? Where would this come <laughs> yeah. from? Yeah, thanks for having me on, Chase. Um, it was – it's been about 25 years now, and I was – working as a as an IT consultant and I was traveling all across the country and I took a new job and I was home every day and my wife said you need a hobby and at that point um I was living in Tuscaloosa and the you know it was baseball season and I was trying to find out information about just random college baseball stuff and I couldn't find it so, you know, I had the business background and I was had the IT skills and I thought, well, hmm, maybe I could just do this. And I really didn't have much writing experience. I always liked it, but I, I really I wasn't trained at all. So I just started calling people. And because in those days there weren't really there wasn't that much interest, people would talk to you. Yeah. And and I I guess I had a little bit of a knack for it and I was able to build some connections and 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 then turn that into, you know, I had my own deal for a while and then um, joined the Rivals Network, did SE Baseball for a decade or so, traveled all over the South, um, covering games. You know, I'd be in, you know, Nashville on Friday and Knoxville on Saturday and Lexington on Sunday and then drive home, you know, and work all week, right, at my day job. So it was, it was more of a labor of love than anything else. 
And then when uh, D1 Baseball put put the put put the, I guess reincarnated, you know, it was a mm-hmm. scoreboard site, and sure. uh, Kyle Peterson got involved and put together a team, and I got invited to be part of that, and and that was uh, and it's, it's, I've been doing it ever since. And then last year, it kind of came full circle because we started this new service called SEC Extra. Sure. Where it's almost like what I was doing before, you know, it really narrowed the focus. So instead of trying to follow, you know, 300 D1 schools, um, I'm following 14. Yeah. And yeah, it's soon going to be 16, but this 16, year it's 14. Mark. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so that has been a, it, it, it's, it's been really fun to kind of get back into it because it's, and you can probably appreciate this when you narrow your scope, you can find so many more stories, right. And you can mm-hmm. follow, follow it that much closer and, and find things that, you know, we're a premium service, find things people are willing to pay for. And I think we've done a pretty good job of that. Yeah. That's what we tell people all the time is if you cover an entire country, you can't be an expert with a hundred no. teams or 50 teams or even 20, you know, 25 teams for the most part. But as you get down, you really can, yeah, you start telling the, the stories and you find the trends that people really care about as we, as we get close, do you, I mean, do, do you get in the, in the mode still? I mean, the juices start flowing as February gets here. What's it like for yeah. you now as you've been doing it this long? Cause I'll be honest, I don't, I have this weird sense. And for me, I guess I've covered Ole Miss. I think this is year 19. If I have it right, hmm. I, I could be one off, but I think it's 19 and I almost dread it right now. And then mm-hmm. once the ball gets thrown, I completely kind of get back in my mode, but I almost have a bit of a depressed feeling for a couple of weeks going, okay, I'm about to do this four or five nights a week away from the mm-hmm. kid, kind of start doing some of that stuff. But then once it gets going, you know, my competitive nature or my storytelling or whatnot kind of, mm-hmm. kind of kicks into gear, but it's a, it's a process for me a little bit as January gets into February, just because there are so many games and so many days. Yeah. Well, for us, because we are, we're doing the season preview right now, we're rolling mm-hmm. those out and we're each, I mean, Joe Healy and is is the other half of of, of our yeah. duo, and and he's he's written, I think, he's doing a, a standalone piece on the um, player breakout players. I'm doing a standalone piece on the schedule analysis, and then we collaborated on a piece of a, a preseason snapshot that's got, um, you know, the, the state of the program. The um, we have anonymous quote. Uh, anonymous coach quotes on on the program on the team uh, a projected lineup um, just random things like that and that kind of that people want to know is heading into the season so so we're in the midst of that now okay so we're the, the season's kind of already started for us mm-hmm. because we're already in that we we gotta we gotta knock this stuff out because you think about it that's 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 about what uh, 56 stories if you put those together um with you know two each for for all 14 teams um and then all the other stuff that you know that, that we're doing it that's not part of the preview so right so so yeah it was december was kind of for me mm-hmm. kind of like where you are now right i, I know this is coming up uh, i've got to get ready and, and get prepped <laughs> um because you know the season's going to be here and and you know, it's in this league, it's and the coaches that we talk to all fall say this, this, this year, the league's going to be better than it's ever been. And I think I might've heard that for each of the last 25 seasons, um, pretty close to it anyways, especially in the last decade or so. I mean, we can talk about why, but, but, but I do believe that, that, that the trajectory of the SEC uh, baseball programs is 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 going to continue to skyrocket you know it, it's it's funny you said that because i i mean it wasn't off the record it was a quote that he i guess he probably gave me thinking i would write it at the time i was talking to carl lafferty almost as recruiting coordinator a few weeks mm-hmm. ago and we were just kind of shooting it about hey what we you know what are they what about this and kind of going through things a little bit and i said so what do you think i mean i kind of just said what's the thesis here of this group and he goes if it was 10 years ago i would think i had one of the best five teams in the country yeah. And that was his answer is because everybody in this league and in general is so much better and everything's so different that he'd go, Hey, I think we're really going to swing it. You know, and we, it, it, it kind of hit me last year. Um, and I think I actually talked with Joe Healy about this on, on, on one of either my podcast or y'all's, I forget which one at this point, but 
everything has changed so quickly that I necessarily didn't adapt to it, especially from a pitching standpoint. I'm, I'm jumping mm-hmm. all over the place. It's not really what I'm going to start, but it's fine. As you know, it wasn't that long ago that you went, hey, I need an ace that goes seven innings. And then my Saturday guy needs to be good and kind of a prospect. But if he's a little wild, it's okay. And then on Sunday, just keep me in it. And that's cool. And that's all we really got to do. And this and this and this. Mm-hmm. And we've completely shifted away from that in, in so quickly. And it's it's a lot of things you said. I mean, it's it got so much harder to pitch last year. And it was mm-hmm. COVID, older players. It was this umpire tracking system that made you have to throw yeah. it in a coffee can. It's sure. frankly, I, I I I went through the whole year thinking that it was even harder to pitch from a strike zone standpoint than the pros, because in the pros you got the high strike. In college, we weren't yeah. even getting the high strike the way that you might at the major league level. And I look up and go, only two pitchers. I forget the exact stat, but only two pitchers averaged like five point four innings or more a start last year. It was Sproud and, and Skeens in the SEC. Now you're just looking for as many guns as possible, and you're just trying to get 81 outs over a weekend, no matter how in the world you got to go about doing it. And you've got to score in the process, too. I look at Ole Miss, and I know they didn't pitch well, and that's still going to mm-hmm. be an issue for them. And, and they got to prove that a little bit. But that was a lineup that also wasn't very good in the SEC. And they had three all SEC caliber yeah. juniors right. that have now left that roster. It is just, it is a completely different world in the SEC right now. Yeah. Well, th- there's a lot there to unpack, yeah, but sure. I, cool. I think one of the things that um, that I've noticed is the there's been such a emphasis on velocity, right? And everybody's you know so focused on radar gun, and 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 boy has that taken off, right? You have so many so many guys on staff that are throwing mid nineties now, and and some you know higher than that, and there's been less emphasis on pitchability and command, not intentionally. But that's not what people value, and that's not what gets you gets you to the league, right? And and I do think that that's played a, a big impact on, you know, you you mentioned the smaller strike zone. Well, if if you're not commanding with a smaller strike zone, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's a problem, right? And and I do think that's that's you know, one of the things. Um, I think the other thing that that you didn't mention that maybe we should is just being able to fill with the transfer portal. Uh, used to you would have a gap. And you just had to live with whoever you had, the best guy. And, you know, or if, or if you had an injury, right, and you guy was going to miss the next year, okay? Well, you're, you're getting by with whoever you got. You move a guy from another position. You're just doing the best you can because you couldn't get your recruiting. High school recruiting's done so far in advance. There's, there, there's no need. Nobody's left, right? Well, now you just go out and you get a ready-made player. And – a lot of times they work out, a lot of times they don't, but at least you have that pipeline to, to mine that, that you never had before because you had to sit out a year, right? So I think that is, that's been a big change. Um, I, I think, you know, obviously, you know, NIL is a, a, a big deal now because you can, sure. you can go out and, and especially in this league, you can, you have some advantages, right? Then, and, and you can get some guys that, Maybe in the past they would stay where they were, but um, you know maybe if they get a better opportunity, uh, get to play in front of, get to play on the SEC network. All your games are televised on ESPN Plus, right? Mom and dad can see me even if they don't make the trip. Um, yeah, playing you know in all these huge uh, stadiums with great atmospheres and all of these things that that kind of all come together that makes the SEC so appealing. And I think because of that, um, all, you know, all of those different things, it's, it's really led to a preponderance of great offensive players and certainly um, certainly a lot of great pitchers too. But it's just – I think it's a little tougher uh, to, to get that. This is a really tough league to pitch in. And, a lot, you know, a lot of these guys who come in who were effective um, at, at smaller levels re- really have difficulty – adjusting to this now there's always the skeins and the Waldrop and guys like that who who, who transfer in and, and flourish right mm-hmm. but but that's the exception honestly uh in my opinion and and where you you're having uh players who are able to i guess develop in the past well now if you don't play the first year 
you're, you're already looking for somewhere else, right? So you don't have that continuity of program. And, that, and that's one of the new challenges that this has brought. Um, and it's both good and bad, right? It, it's good that maybe you're stuck behind a great shortstop. You're never going to beat him out and you can go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we've all had these stories of guys who, who weren't great for two years. And then the third year, the light comes on and they get their opportunity and, and you know, they're, they're a legend, right? So, yeah. so it's a lot of stuff to, 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 to chatter about there, but, um, but yeah, I think that's, that's really where the game is at this point. Um, a lot of, uh, a lot of changes in the last few years that, that just weren't there, you know, when you're talking about what, what Carl was talking about 10 years ago, it's just a different game. You know, it, it's one of the reasons why, you know, if Ole Miss wants to think that they're being optimistic from that pitching staff standpoint, and they, they and they brought a couple guys in, but it's it's mm -hmm. a lot of the people that are just back with JT Quinn and Sonia and see what you got. And in their minds, maybe that is just simply a freshman to sophomore development. Mm -hmm. They get into year two. It's obviously ki kids that were highly touted, highly recruited. And I think it snowballed on them a little bit too, because, you know, you come from the summer circuit where everything is about – pitching and velocity as you said there's no clock they can take their time they can breathe mm -hmm. they can do all these things they got big strike zones because you know perfect game complexes they're trying to play these games mm -hmm. in 90 minutes and move it along and suddenly you get on the mound and it's culture shock because the clock's moving and you don't have time to reset you can't step off and the small strike zone too it was probably harder as a freshman to pitch than ever mm -hmm. before in the sec for a lot of those reasons and then the one other guy that Ole Miss has been counting on and will count on next year was Xavier Rebus, and he's coming from mm -hmm. a D2 school. So that's a different scenario than he would be used to. And he's got that sure. whole change coming from Indianapolis. And, you know, I, and maybe every SEC school did this. I don't know. But I know Ole Miss, Mike was – you almost kind of quoted him verbatim, not realizing it. He was talking about pitchability to the point that they – during the fall, they put the zone on the board instead of velocity and had mm -hmm. a – electronic strike man strike zone that was even tighter than the normal college strike zone and went wow. nope we're going to throw strikes we're going to walk as hitters we're going to throw strikes and not walk people as pitchers and he spent those weeks just trying to ingrain in them that hey we we, we have Love to it. throw strikes and can't do yeah. that right here so he went he went completely the other way he went nope we're gonna we're mm -hmm. gonna put the square on the board and it's gonna tell you whether you threw a ball or a strike or not yeah i love that that's that's awesome i i do think that you know there's something to be said for guys who who go out and have to learn on the job, right? Mm -hmm. Especially talented players like you know, the, you know the, the three you just brought up is a, the probable rotation. Being able to to learn and Liam and, Dole from Coastal, I do think he probably comes into that. But anyway, yeah, so, right. some listeners going to correct me, so I'll go ahead and cut myself off there. Yeah, well, you know, and, and that's the thing. Hope you know, hopefully you improve from that. I mean, one mm -hmm. of one of Joe's favorite my cohort, uh, Joe's favorite quotes, Butch Thompson told him one time, you know players are allowed to get better <laughs> and, and that kind of stuck with me right because we we've seen guys you know especially pitchers get lit up and then oh why are you bringing him in well he's allowed to get better right he's practicing mm -hmm. every day right so I, I think those are the kinds of things that uh you know that that we'll be able to to see right I, you know how much how much has this evolved over time and how much you know, you know, who's made that jump, not just from a, you know, getting physically stronger and maturing and all those things that happen from, you know, when you're time, you're 19 to your 20, you're, you're still kind of filling out and, and developing your, your, your man body. And then, but also mentally, right. Just being able to handle, handle success and then handle mm -hmm. when it's not success and how do you respond? And, and those, I mean, they got some valuable lessons. So, you know, we'll see. I'm, I'm optimistic on Ole Miss, honestly. I'm, it's, they're almost an impossible team to, to prognosticate because there's, there's, there's just a lot of unknowns, uh, both in the lineup with, with the transfers, the new players. Yeah, so and portal heavy. The, in the lineup offense. is going to be all, all transfer guys just about. And, um, and then, you know, pitching wise, um, you know, is, is Quinn the guy, right? Has, mm -hmm. Is he developed into the Friday night guy that's going to match up with, you know, the Ben Hess and whoever Florida throws out there and, you know, LSUs, they they packed with them. Those kinds of uh, elite guys that, that you have to have to, to be successful. 
baseball is such a getting hot momentum game and different than the other sport. I'm curious because you, 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 you guys at SCX actually wrote the, um, the transfer portal story about kind of what the mentalities are around that. I think that maybe it was at D1 completely nationally, but maybe an SEC. I don't know. You can correct me on what that was revolving around. But, um, you know, you, you look at it, and Vanderbilt, obviously talented, but they won a national championship. as like the seventh seed in the SEC tournament. Ole Miss was the mm-hmm. last team in. They win it two years ago. Are we getting to an, into an era where because every SEC team has some NIL and can go get a player or fix a hole – it mm-hmm. increases parity or in your mind, are we getting into an era potentially where these three, four or five programs that have the NIL to put together super teams are going to really step forward? What do you, what do you sort of see as the, the, the yeah. impact of this? Are we getting less parity or more as the NIL increases? Oh, I think we're going to get less. Okay. Yeah. Um, I and, agree. and I think it's because, I mean, you, you had, I mean, you have really like a team, a program like Alabama, who you know, but to the casual fan, you think, well, Alabama, they're they're probably just loaded with NIL, right? Well, that's football. Yeah. That's not baseball, right? And they have two of the top transfers in the country leave, right? So LSU got Luke Holman. He's got to either pitch on Friday or Saturday for them, right? He was Alabama's Friday night starter. Colby Shelton. It's going to be Florida's starting shortstop. He had 25 home runs last year as a true freshman. Yes. Dude can play, right? Yeah. You lose those guys. Not only do you lose them, but you lose them to teams within your conference, you know, who, who have more established, um, you know, programs, uh, more established both from a winning and, and also, you know, from, from an NIL standpoint. So I, I think those are the things that, that's going to make it more challenging for the, you know, the second half of the SEC to compete with the top half of the SEC. However, right, it all runs downhill. So there, there are also programs that are out, you know, not in the SEC, who the bottom half, the Alabama, the, you know, Kentucky or, you know, whomever can go out and grab players from them. And a lot of times those players can play too, Mm -hmm. right? They just haven't had the opportunity. So, um, so it's definitely changing. It makes it really hard to to have those great mid-major programs. I know Oral Roberts sure. made it to Omaha last year, and that was an incredible story. But I, I I do question, you know, how how you're how sustainable that's going to be. Because I mean, they went out to the portal and they got a bunch of old guys who had mm-hmm. played elsewhere and brought them in, and, and maybe that's the way to do it. Find guys who just, you know, for whatever reason weren't able to get it done consistently at, at a big program and maybe that's that's the way they do it but i do think that the young players are going to jump because the, the things we talked about they're going to get an opportunity to play in this league they're going to get seen by more scouts all that good stuff yeah i mean it, it's it's what was funny about last year is that you know Ole Miss didn't necessarily go grab one of the top two or three guys but they had a good bit of nil to spend Ole Miss is going to put into baseball because it's, it's ingrained yeah. in the program the community and everything else but they got a huge number of kids. They got this huge shopping list. So for Ole Miss, you know, when you when you break it down to a micro level, what I find interesting about them is they need to be able to develop arms or something to not need this huge list because, you know, if, if a team – if Team X has $1 million to spend, just throwing a number that's easy math out there, and they need nine players, and one team has a million and needs two players, well, yeah. I can get a totally different caliber of player when I'm doing right. that. and. That's where Ole Miss got stuck was, hey, their offense and their pitching needs this. And they brought mm-hmm. in guys that might very well be really good in the SEC, but it's this huge group. And, you know, mm-hmm. Mike's kind of said, hey, we can't need that many every year. We got some stuff going on and it's going to be all right. But you look at it and if you, if you if you need too much, you just simply can't compete with, you know, the A&Ms and the Floridas and the LSUs mm-hmm. and the Tennessees and those three or four teams, Arkansas at times, mm-hmm. that's up there at the very top of that – of the league and – yeah, you can get lost really quickly, you know, and it's, it's to me, it is the college story that if, if a national person has written it, I have not seen it. And and my listeners are going to roll their eyes because I talk about this all the time, but it's the competition inside an athletic department on where the NIL dollars get split between sports mm-hmm. sports that I find so fascinating because, you know, you look at Ole Miss right now, their basketball team's winning. Chris Beard's been hired and they're 16 mm-hmm. and three or oh, whatever. Yeah. Well, People are going, hey, give Beard the NIL. He took Texas right. Tech to two Elite Eights and a championship game, and you got Lane Kiffin doing this, and they're trying yeah. to make the playoffs in football. You can't max out everybody. 
I mean, it, it's just it's just straight math that unless it's you know all all ships get rise with the tide and all this stuff, mm-hmm. a dollar that goes to football doesn't go to baseball. A dollar that goes to basketball yeah. doesn't go to football, and and that yin and yang. And it's I find song. that really really yeah. funny. Where it, for baseball programs to completely thrive, they probably need one of the other two major sports to be struggling somewhat to pick mm-hmm. up those secondary dollars. Yeah, I, and that's a that's a great point. I think the other part. That, that we haven't mentioned yet is is in football the nil money is used to retain your players mm-hmm. almost as much as it is to to recruit new ones right mm-hmm. and and just have been conversations around the league that hasn't made it to baseball yet maybe maybe a, a player or two but that they're really at least on the record there hasn't been any anybody who's been able to quote hold a team hostage you know for lack mm-hmm. of a better term um to, in order to get you know, a, a, a big chunk, um, mainly because the numbers aren't that big, but, but I think also it's just, it's newer and, and I think, you know, that's coming and that's just kind of the, the world that one of those changes that, that, that we're facing. And, and I, I know a lot of fans are I don't know, put off by that. Um, do you want your players that you, you got used to watching and you're excited about seeing them? You want them back for the next year, especially if you have a young star. Right. And he goes and plays for your rival. That sucks. Right. So that's that's a hard thing for for a fan to 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 kind of come to grips with. So but that's part that's part of part of the environment of football. And, and you know, I, I, I do feel like we're, we're going to see that in, in college baseball as well. What do you think the overall impact is? I mean, just from fan base, I mean, we mentioned parody and whatnot. But I mean, are, are, are we getting into a. Do you feel like this is more enjoyable or less enjoyable? I mean, how do you just sort of feel about it in general? I mean, do you feel like it's bad well, for the sport, good for the sport, a little bit of both? Yeah. Well, the way that that I like to look at it is things can two things can be true. Okay. Sure. So the sport has never been more popular than it is now. Sure. Okay. There's more interest. There's more more kids going to to college versus going to the pros. They're staying in college longer. Um, and, you know, not, we're not just talking about high school guys, but, but juniors are coming back for, for their senior year and playing, um, great ballparks, great excitement, all these, all these cool things, but don't confuse popularity with health. Okay. Cause if anything we've noticed out there, something can be popular and be awful for you. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, sure. so I am concerned, you know, as, as, you know, as one of these people who's who's given a lot to the sport over the last three decades that, that, that we are heading in some, I don't know, some, some tough waters to navigate and maybe we make it through, but, but the concerns that I have are, it's just the, the big C between the haves and have nots. And, and also the other part that we, we haven't broached yet is if you make, if you make your employees, I mean, make your athletes employees, um, what does that do to sports like college baseball? Because there there would be a few who could do it, but we have over three hundred in D one. That, that 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 kills it, everything, it, but football and men's basketball yeah. at the majority of yeah. campuses across the country. It's it it, to, it totally kills the other sports. You're exactly right, and it, and that's you know change is hard, and sometimes change is good, but I don't think I mean that 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 change is probably good for football but it really sucks for everybody else. And, you know, you can make the argument that football's paying the bills and why should it subsidize, you know, mm-hmm. all these other sports. And I, I hear you, but that's, that, that's what we have. And, and, and changing that is, is going to be, you know, that, that's going to be met with a lot of resistance. Ole Miss put out their uh, financial report today for fiscal year 2023, and I think Ole Miss ended up 120 something thousand in the black for uh, for baseball. But they're what one of five schools tops that probably does that nationally. Mm-hmm. I would think. I mean, not actually turning a profit and paying for itself. I mean, you're talking about state Arkansas, South Carolina, LSU. LSU. I mean that that that's about A&M. it probably. Yeah. I would assume. Yeah. So that's where that's at. Yeah. I just I, I just think. If we get to the point of employees, because we discuss this all the time from a football standpoint, but mm-hmm. it's the same conversation, that that's the end. That's when I think club sports become what the majority of sports are, and it just completely takes on a different level at that yeah. point, and it's, and it's completely different. 
um, in all those ways. And, and, and I get the parody thing. And I, I guess that would be my question is, you know, just the atmosphere and community around baseball. How do you feel like it's impacted versus football? Because it's less corporate. It's mm-hmm. fan bases that really try to care about the players. And it's not as much laundry because and I think this is fair. You know, in football, a lot of fans, you know, you sort of get your – your mood or your self-esteem, how your team's mm-hmm. doing. And it's this huge club and I'm a, you know, I'm an Alabama or Ole Miss fan or I'm whatever. Baseball is a lot more intricate on, Hey, I'm, I'm with that guy and I see this and you've got to be a little yeah. more in tune to be the really diehard or even the casual baseball fan to that level. I think you're, I think you're suffering like what you're talking about. I completely agree with you that we're maybe we're in the Snickers bar phase of this where we're getting the sugar mm-hmm. rush, but that doesn't mean that it's helping our, our bloodstream in any way. Yeah. Because you need stories like Tim Elko and these guys that have been around yeah. for a minute and do that that you're talking about. If you're just simply bringing in mercenaries, I think there's at least the argument that that hurts college baseball more than it hurts the average sport. Well, when you were talking, it sort of reminded me of something. Um, I think a lot of the allure to baseball and why those of us who like it like it and the many who don't don't is you feel a connection. Okay. Mm-hmm. Is it a connection to to your past where you, you're growing up, going to the games with your dad or your granddad, or is it to the to a player on the field, right, that you've seen that player go through and have some struggles? Or maybe it was a great play, that, and, you, and you were really excited about it, and you want to come back and see how how that player progresses. And if they're, you know, if, if they're gone, right, if they're only there for a year and then there's a new guy that you have to develop, that that's that's more challenging, right? Um, maybe it's not to the extreme where you know the whole team flips over every year. I hope we don't get to that point. Uh, we don't want minor league baseball, right? Mm-hmm. Um, where, where you have a new roster, you know, from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. So I, I do think that you need some continuity. You need to develop those connections in order to to maintain a fan base. Because um, I I don't think a lot of casuals will come back, right? Um, casuals come when it's when things are great and they come to see winners, but your core fan base is there because they have a connection. And whatever you can do to maintain that connection is, is I think, the, the key to marketing to that next, that next, uh, next fan. Just thought about this completely off topic. I'll probably come back to what we're talking about in a second. But uh, from an Ole Miss angle, Mike mm-hmm. Bianco going into his 24th season at this point. Um, he was hired June of 2000. Um, he's passed Skip Bertman now for the second most SEC wins of all time and and got his title two years ago. You know, he had a very complicated tenure until the title. I mean, I've, mm-hmm. I've spent more time than I'll ever want to do because I can play both sides of, hey, he's yeah. underachieved, he's overachieved, he's done this, he's done that. What is the Ole Miss program versus everybody else? I mean, I, I've made a living off of that conversation. As somebody who follows it so closely but is not sitting here in Oxford every day, what is Mike Bianco's sort of legacy in this sport at this point? Um, he's he's always put a good product on the field until maybe last year, and that's why it was so shocking to everyone. I mean, you First just, time he's ever gone less yeah. than 13 and 17. Yeah. Um, so – that was, I think, just kind of hard to hard to understand because nobody saw this coming. I mean, mm-hmm. we I think we had them preseason top ten, <laughs> um, certainly up there. Boy, we were yeah. smart, right? Um, but but that that's kind of the point. I mean, it on paper it's a good looking team. You know, some pitching injuries didn't help, but it shouldn't have been a fall off that far. So so I think that's the the big question. Um, you know, I always thought this was kind of odd if because Ole Miss you know the year the other Rebels win it all that's where I was going it's it's actually two regular seasons that have been really strange yeah yeah the last team in the field if there's one more stolen bid right Mark you can make the the argument that if NC State gets in instead of Ole Miss might be Anko's fired at the end of the season you know yeah that that, I I think that was because he had his dalliance with LSU the offseason before that's one Omaha in 22 mm-hmm. years. 
receivers. That's all that's that, that stuff comes to the forefront in such a powerful way. And instead yeah. they get in, they get hot, Dilution Elliott carry him to a title, and mm-hmm. he's making 1.7 million. He's the highest paid public school coach in the country, <laughs> and they'll put a statue up here at some point. Yeah. All right. It's it's you know, it's it's so uh so interesting how those how those couple dominoes fall somewhere else in the country, right? And and here's the here's the payoff here but yeah i mean there there's a lot of respect for what he's accomplished and it's just it's really hard to stay in this league and do this do this job for that for that long Mm -hmm. that's what you know look at what dave van horn and tim corbin are still doing i mean you've got to be really driven to be able to get come to work and work this hard against all these great coaches because you know what we talked about great players wanting to come to this league um, because of the salaries that the SEC programs can pay, they're going out and getting the best best coaches too, mm-hmm. right? So you, you've got a you got kind of a who's who of guys to, to go after, or coming after you uh, every, you know, every time you every time you you, you lay some up. So um, it's uh, certainly Mike earned some equity, <laughs> earned some some goodwill. Um, you never take take that championship away but you 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 do want to see more than you you know you, you can't have another year like last year you you, yeah, you have to understand what's going on here and and where's where are we you know are are we able to handle this new era you know we talked about all these different changes right. um are, are we able to adjust and find our find our level um with, with all these changes and he did it from a go out and get pieces that seem like they make sense. You're able to be yeah. successful in the portal because look, there's two parts of this. And we've learned this through Ole Miss's football program, maybe than any program in the country because of how Lane attacks the portal and on from a football side is there's two parts to being successful in this era. It's having the NIL and the ability to recruit and to actually get the players in the portal. And mm-hmm. then two, pick the right players that don't screw with chemistry. Because mm-hmm. those are two completely different things, especially yeah. in a baseball season. It's such a marathon and and goes through like it goes because Ole Miss did that. Ole Miss in football two years ago picked up a ton of portal guys, fell mm-hmm. apart down the stretch because a lot of stuff was going on. They end up eight and five in the Texas Bowl after starting eight and one. Well, this past year, the entire season lane goes, hey, I just like these guys on how they interact in the locker room. I like how they mm-hmm. handle adversity. They win the Peach Bowl. They're a top 10 team going into next year and all this kind of stuff. Mike pulled off the first part, which not everybody mm-hmm. in the country can do. There's only 10 schools probably that can do it to the level that Ole Miss did it. But we don't know, did you mm-hmm. evaluate everything else? Does it coexist? Does it meld? Do you, are you still developing your guys? And that's that's where I'm kind of fascinated because I do. I, I feel like this is a huge, huge season for him to mm-hmm. – I don't think they have to go 20 and 10 in the league or anything, but just get back to the postseason, win 14 yeah. to 16 SEC games, and – show no 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 we've stabilized this thing and we can compete in this era as it stands yeah it's 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 being competitive and giving you giving you some sort of proof of concept that okay last year was you know that ne- never speak of it again it was just yeah. I mean, Van Horn did it once you know Arkansas yeah, right. was like nine and right. seven and 23 or whatever that right. one year yeah but, so it's I, I I agree I mean that you you, you covered it I, I do think that uh, there's talent, um, but, but there was talent last year. Uh, I, I think there's older talent, and that's that's a nice combo. If you get an old team that that has dudes, the, mm-hmm. the the concern I have is, you know, so does everybody else in this league. That's the thing. He's just trying to – I mean, we were trying to go through picking teams 1 through 14, and, and Missouri is 14. But then, who's 13, Right. I really don't know. You, it's why, and and if they made a decision, I'm not aware of it. I know, I know you guys have reported on this a little bit. It's when they go to 16, they have to let all 16 into Hoover. You can't have a stigma on kicking anybody out because there, I believe that 15 of the 16 teams might be in the top 23 in the country. And if they got hot, be able to move into a college world series possibility. Yeah. So you can't do anything to keep that stigma out of it. I yeah, think. and that's the way the coaches feel. Okay, the the coaches want all sixteen there. The question is, how do you do that without adding a day? Yeah, okay. and it's already so long. Yep, because the coaches don't want the extra day. No, I mean no, they want to Ray Tanner this thing and, and see how fast they can go home. And honestly, the the top 
four or five teams don't even want to be there, mm -hmm. right? If they can just go and play a game and, and get a guy, get a few guys a little bit of work, they'd be happy, right? Um, so it's, but, but then you have the other side of it, the teams need wins. So I kind of think w what's going to happen is you're going to have the teams at the bottom are going to be in some sort of pool or double elimination kind of thing, play in, play -in where they get more games and can help their, help their uh, postseason chances. And then they get to the end and there's these other teams waiting on them who have earned it from being there all year. And they're not going to have to play many games because it's already going to be Saturday by then. Right. So I, I would look for something like that. Um, you but, do think uh, still think we're Tuesday to Sunday. I don't know that you can add another day. I yeah, think if yeah, anything, yeah. you, you might go single elimination all the way through and, Oh, you know, you could do that, but I don't know that people really want to do that because you're, you're still going to be playing a lot of games if you're the, the best team. And I don't know that there's appetite for that. And I think that's why, you know, that's the logical thing. Oh, just go single elimination one through 16. And and that's the, the, the feedback I hear. Yeah. I don't like it. If, yeah. If that I'm feels... Florida and I don't want to have to play four games. I'm not, I don't have anything to prove. Um, let me play one or two. Right. And, or, or whoever's, you know, yeah, the sure, top team sure. back here. But, um, but, but if, if I'm, a, if I'm a bubble team, and I can play three games against good RPI teams. Heck, I win two of those. Mm -hmm. um, even, even if it's a single elimination, you know, when I'm out, I go two and one. Hey, I'm happy, man. Uh, I didn't take two losses from a double elimination. I went through. I picked up two two quality wins. And now they got the quad quad deals involved. And we can talk about that too. But it's – so you're going to have more opportunities because the SEC is going to have more more high RPIs. You predict that stuff as well as anybody anybody I know. Do we overplay how much these tournaments matter? Um, sometimes we do. Yeah, I mean, it's case there, by case because yeah, the committee's is. not consistent. I understand right. that it is. Um, I, I do think that you can play your way in. Um, you've certainly seen some SEC teams do that over the past mm -hmm. few years. Um, and if you go zero and one, you know, on the play in day. And, you know, other things get weird around the rest of the country. You get squeezed out. Um, I, that, that's probably the more more common common deal. Um, it's going to be interesting because 643 Charts is a, is a partner of ours at D1, and they've come up with an alternate alternative to the RPI. It's called the Diamond Sports Rating, DSR. Okay. And we're going to be, we're going to be having it on our, on our site that people can come look at. And um, it looks at, you know how with the RPI, you can um, just by playing a bad team, say Ole Miss goes and plays, say Alcorn is terrible, right? You're going to, RPI is going to drop whether you win or lose, right? Just by playing the game, that strength of schedule, which is such a big part of the, part of the, uh, the formula, you're going to fall. Well, w the whole deal behind the DSR is it's a zero-sum game based on probability. So if I have a 90% chance of winning, okay, I'm going to gain a little bit of those points, but I'm not going to lose anything just by playing the game. I see right? what you mean. Okay. So I, I, I'm not disincentivized from, from, from playing anyone. Right? I can play whoever I want. You just may not get as much points for playing Alcorn versus playing Southern Miss, right? You get a lot of points for, for beating them, but you also have a higher probability to lose. So it's it's those sorts of things that I think is is a better better approach. And there's one more part of it that I really like is because it's, it's looking ahead and trying to be predictive, okay, based on runs per game and mar margin of victory and all these advanced stats, right? So it's going to rank them in the order – that it would favor them in. So DSR hmm. number one is going to be favored on a neutral field against DSR number two. We've all seen in the RPI that, you know, Dallas Baptist is the yeah, number two right. RPI team and you're going to take them o over number eight LSU. No, you're not. Right. And, and I think everybody kind of can, can get behind. Well, especially the committee, perhaps, since they tend to just kind of sort by RPI. Um, if you have a rating system that is predictive on who would win, that to me is more palatable. So, but it's a new system, 
So we need to see, I mean, these are, these are great selling points, but, but it's new and we need to see it as the year mm -hmm. goes on and, and learn what it's, what it does well and maybe what it doesn't. And then maybe they can address what it doesn't. And then for year two of it, maybe, maybe that's a, a bigger component and, and that gets brought in as an RPI alternative. I would like it a lot because you're solving two of these cancel games late in the year because yep. people go, Oh, just play better teams, but it's, it's regionality. You can't put a you cannot put a fifty six game schedule together against all good teams. Because look, Ole Miss canceled against Arkansas State two years ago um, on the last week of the regular season. Mm -hmm. Had they played that game, it's in the book. I don't remember exactly. They if they had won, they would have fallen four spots in the RPI, and if they lost, they would have fallen fourteen. I think is what it mm -hmm. was. If they don't cancel that game, Ole Miss doesn't make the postseason and doesn't win the national title simply by mm -hmm. not playing the game. That's a great story. I mean that's that that's it because they were they they had swept LSU to get back in it and to get back in the regular season and try to make Hoover and all that kind of stuff and the AD Keith Carter had started running the numbers and calling people and going okay what's the RPI going to do and the Arkansas State AD at the time had just been hired from Alabama so he was dealing with twenty five other things and they mm -hmm. call and go hey can we cancel this and the guy's like dude whatever send the ten thousand on the buyout we don't care about right. that right now sounds good but yeah that ended up saving their uh their season at that point you you were mentioning teams and i guess you brought up vanderbilt and corbin mm -hmm. they've had such an advantage for so long they've put together all these pro prospects they have word of mouth rec recognition they, they've won all these games they've had this scholarship situation that's been better than anybody in the country mm -hmm. are you selling them in this era now from relative to what they have been um as long as Corbin's there, he he's going to find ways to win. I'm I'm a believer. Um, I do think that maybe some of those advantages are not as pronounced. Okay. Um, I, and because in the NIL era, I mean, a lot of these guys are getting their school paid for through other means, right? They don't need the the the, the academic scholarships or need based or however you want to word that. Um, I, I do think that. Um, they're so good at what they do and they invest so heavily in the game that that plays, right? It's, it's like defense that plays on the road and in, in football, right? Or in the cold weather defense plays. I think the way that they develop, especially pitchers and now, I mean, they're able to, to get guys who want that Vanderbilt education. They want mm -hmm. to come there. They know they're going to be developed. Um, I think as long as that's in place, they're always going to be good. And I mean, they've got a freshman lefty, Michael, Michael Vane. Now that's, he's the next one. Oh, we're he's, shocked. Mark Vanderbilt has a freshman lefty. Well, yeah, oh, I'm, I, I'm amazed. He's, I'm, he's a big I'm, tall, you know, throws hard competes. He's not like 98 as a freshman. So he'll be three digits shortly. Um, he's just, you know, he's the next one, right. For, for them. There's other ones, other good ones around the league. LSU's got one, Cam Johnson, who's mm -hmm. I saw him this fall. Uh, they played uh, Louisiana in a um, exhibition scrimmage. Mm -hmm. He faced six batters and struck out all six. Really, um, throws hard and has, you know, he's just an advanced freshman, right? And then there's Liam Peterson for Florida, who's going to be their Saturday guy, true freshman, another six five, two hundred twenty pound guy throwing ninety eight. Just, I mean, these guys are years old. School, nineteen years old. Yeah, and, and that's kind of what we talked about before. There, the, I mean, because ten years ago they wouldn't have, and and now they are, and 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 they're going to be, you know, they're going to be on the SEC network for three years, mm -hmm. and, and and have all these opportunities that, and who knows, um, it, it can work out pretty well for you. I, you know, Paul Skeens, uh, I hear he's. Here he's got a, a pretty attractive girlfriend. Uh, if you know that story, <laughs> I, I think things worked out for him. Yeah, yeah, so, it's been a good um, year to be Paul Skeen. Yeah, it has, hasn't it? So yeah. it's it's kind of one of those one of those deals where you know if you're the guy, the big man on campus, there's a lot of good things that can happen. We obviously last year, kind of last thing, I appreciate the time we were talking about the pitching and the changes, and it kind of sneaking up on us. Is there one or two things that you think will be sort of the the conference wide storylines? I mean, what are we going to be talking about when May gets here? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, probably the I think there's going to be six SEC teams that are might be in the top eight in the country. 
I think it's going to be that heavy. I think you're going to have, you're going to be rolling in looking at the top eight national seeds, and there's going to be at least five of them from this conference and maybe six. And and Wake Forest is going to be there and someone else is going to emerge, you know, but I really think because of all the advantages we talked about and the ability yeah. to assemble, assemble talent, um, it's the, the, the best teams in this league are the best teams in the country. And there's depth with good teams. You know, a lot of years we have two, three good teams in the SEC. And then you have that next group. They're all good and, and, and might win other leagues. But now you've now like some of those programs have elevated. And mm-hmm. I really think, I mean, and we'll list them here. It's going to be Florida and Arkansas and LSU and Tennessee and Vanderbilt and A&M. And those, those okay. teams are going to be head and shoulders above, uh, at least on paper, uh, the 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 rest of the conference, and then you've got a big, a big group, probably all the way down to to thirteen, where if things go well, maybe they can join that group, or if they don't, they they miss Hoover, right? And I right. I think there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, variability with those teams. There, there's going to be some three seed out of the SEC that a host is going to look up and go, oh, hell, what are we yeah. like? What, what, what are we doing right. here? This is, right. yeah, I know they went 13 and 17, but give me a break. That's, yeah. that's, that, that, that's ridiculous. That's what Cause, and that's the thing, because all conferences aren't created equal. So, I mean, it, you know, how did, how did Ole Miss do last year with all, we talked about how bad they were. How'd they do against the Big Ten? They went eight and one. <laughs> how, yeah. How do you think they would have done in the Big Ten last yeah. year? Probably been okay, <laughs> right? And, and it would have been a, you know, they've yeah. been back in the regional, and who knows? You get get hot. In the Maryland regional. three or four. I've seen it happen. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I know. It, it, it's gonna be hey, it's a little weird. They're uh, they're starting out in Hawaii this year, so it's a yeah. little uh, you know that that Arizona tournament kind of fell through for them, kind of like it did for Vanderbilt a couple mm-hmm. years ago. Whenever, so they're ended up they're gonna they're gonna play the Warriors four times to to kick mm-hmm. this thing off. They they do have Iowa coming to Swayze though. Yeah, that that should be good. I was good, man. Brody Breck is a legit. Legit prospect, a pitcher, kind of an interesting story. He was a wide receiver on the football team, and of course, he wasn't getting any action there because they never throw the ball. So mm-hmm. he gave up football, and now he's he's one of the top pitchers. That's the right call. Yeah, don't you think he's yeah, going to be a first right rounder? Decision. Throws throws like hundred and one. I mean, he's one of those cats. Are you so, uh, you track you traveling much? What's the plan? Yeah, I'm I'm going to do a few. Um, I know I'm going to Columbia for the Clemson South Carolina series. They were both really good last year. They have one of those split venue deals yeah, where yeah, they yeah. you know they they do that. Uh, and I'm going to Gainesville for the opener where they are the C, uh, conference opener where they play A and M. That should be good. I think both those teams will be off to good starts. And that's as far as I've gotten. We'll see. Um, opening opening weekend is is kind of kind of sparse here a lot of sec teams getting fat so i may just do that from home and and, and do the multi-screen viewing thing and mm-hmm. and kind of edge out well i appreciate it bud uh great to talk to you to catch up uh like i said appreciate your yeah. work for a really long time your friendship and let's uh as we get this thing going let's uh let's do it again yeah enjoy it man